Come on, come on, come on. So for over 30 years, this woman has been our office manager. She knows where all the skeletons are buried in this ministry. She has, she has been a volunteer. She's been a board member. She's been our bookkeeper. She has just done an incredible job. I think the count is, you have, did you keep work with all, all eight of the ministers or six of the eight? How many of the ministers have you... Okay, she was last hired by Tom Catlin over 30 years ago to be, the, to be the office manager. She has just done an incredible job for our ministry all these years. Today, the flowers are in your honor. And so we love you, we bless you, and we truly appreciate you. You're downstairs, um, if, there's a reception after this. It's a lovely reception. There are big cards on each of the tables. You can write a blessing to her. Um, Sandy, we just love you. You, yes. I, yes. Sandy wanted to retire a couple years ago, and I and I begged her to stay, and and she said it's just time. So she's going to give us another month or so to train her replacement. But today, it is all about you. So we're going to say to Sandy, we love you, we bless you, and we truly appreciate you. Together, we love you, we bless you, and we truly appreciate you. Sandy. All right. So I invite you to join me in this time of prayer and meditation. Take a deep breath. And feel the presence of God. Tonight, and today, we awaken to all that God is. We awaken to all that God is in us. That we are not separate from our Creator, but we are the living expression of all that God is. So do it today, we awaken. We awaken to the truth of our soul. We awaken to the power within us. We awaken to the living Christ. The fullness of who we were created to be. You were created in the image and likeness of God. You're an expression of God's spirit. That when God breathed life into you, you were given God's spirit, God's essence. You were given God's power and life and joy and peace and asked to go into the world and to be God's light in the world, to be God's love in the world to be God's hands and God's feet. And your soul said, yes. I am willing to express all that God is in me. I'm willing to love, and to heal, and to bless, and to transform every worldly situation. To bring my essence, my power, my love, my joy, to work for the good of myself and for the good of all. And that living, moving Spirit of God knew that it was good and only good that you would express your nature and make a difference in the world. So today we say yes to God. 
Tonight, today we say yes to that presence, to that power. We say yes to our mission and our purpose. To bring light and love and joy to the world. To bear God's spirit. To be God's instrument. To be the living expression of all that God is. To follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ and be a light unto the world. Holy Spirit, use us. Lift us higher. Awaken all that we are meant to be. And in the silence now, I invite you to feel the activity of God within you. And in your heart of hearts, say yes. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, for this day. Thank you, God, for your spirit that goes before me, for your blessings too numerous to name, for all that you are, God, all that you are in me and all that you are in the world. I say thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And so it is. Amen. So this week online, I, I invited people into a 40-day challenge. And the challenge was that for 40 days, there was an affirmation that I gave people. And I said, for 40 days, I'm going to invite you to affirm it 100 times a day. And some people are like, I'm in, let's go. Some people are like, 40, 100 times, that's too, 40 days, that's too And I said, let's just do it. Because like, how many of you know if you want to come up with an excuse, you can always find one? Right? And then we just do it, and it's like, wow, that was just much easier than I thought. So the affirmation that I gave people, let's shoot it up there. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Will you say that with me? Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. How many of you sometimes notice that your mind goes a little south? <laughs> that you may go into worry or fear? Like part of this spiritual journey that we're on is really mastering the mind. That when we master our mind, when we can actually decide what thoughts and ideas that we're going to entertain, everything in our life gets easier. So the next 40 days, your dominant thought is every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Now, if you're anything like me, there's a part of you that says, yeah, right. Right? Like, we all have that ego part of us that says it's not really going to work. Why should I even bother? It's too much energy. It's too much time. I should just stay in my cranky self and just let life roll. Right? But what I want you to see is that when you master your thoughts, you master everything. When your thoughts don't just go all over the place, but when you're truly in charge of what your dominant thought and feeling is, you change the world. So people have asked me, well, how do I do it 100 times? I said, the way I do it is 20 times before I get out of bed, 20 times at breakfast, 20 times at lunch, 20 times at dinner, and 20 times before I go to bed. And we're going to do it 10 times now. 10 times? <laughs> Richard, a little excessive, right? So we're going to do it 10 times. And the other question is, how do you count? And I go, one, two, and I have to use my fingers. 
So for me to get to 20, I have to use both hands twice. Good. Okay, we're all math students. We can do this. You ready? Here we go. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Last time, every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. Now, can you feel the difference? It does. It works. Like when we use the power of the spoken word, it works. And right now, there are hundreds of people around the country that have joined me in this challenge. Now, do you have to? No. You have a God-given right to be as miserable as you want to be, right? But if you want to play, I'm going to invite you to play. And let's just see in 40 days from now, when you've taken dominion over your thought process, where you are. How many of you have a favorite game? Anybody have a favorite card game or game that you play? In my house right now, our, my, our in-laws gave to all the kids the game Farkle. Anybody know the game Farkle? Dice game Farkle, six dice, you roll the dice, and, and you can Farkle, and then everybody else Farkle if you mess up. And, it, and it's just a ton of fun, right? Because I think that life gets to be about as fun as we want to make it. And I want you to see how much fun your life can be. I'm going to start a new series today based on uh, Florence Chin book, The Game of Life and How to Play It. And, and she asked the question, does life feel like a game to you or a burden? A burden. Does it feel like a game or a burden? How many of you can think of a time in your life where it felt like a burden? The life was a burden. It was like, oh, please, no. Right? We can all think of those times. And what I want you to really check into, do you feel like God, that life is a game that you're playing? That, that it really is an opportunity for you to bring more joy and creativity, to make changes and to play. And so the first question is, is life a game or a burden? The second question, do you feel like you're winning at the game of life? And the third question then is, if life is a game, are you playing the right game? And the question that, that really leads into this is some of us are playing a game that's not our game to play at all. Some of us have been playing a game since childhood that isn't our game. It might have been our parents' game or a friend's game or it's the game we thought we were supposed to be playing. And we're actually playing somebody else's game. And, and if you're going to win at the game of life, but you're playing the wrong game, it's not really helpful. And for most of us, I want you to really check in this phase of your life, in this time of your life, are you playing the game that is the most important to you now? Are you playing the game that really will give your soul the most enjoyment, the most nurturing? You know, um, I had an opportunity to, I, I still do some corporate stuff on the side. And a couple of weeks ago, I, had, I did a, an hour-long corporate training. And, and one of the things that we did in that hour was I invited people to look at the game they were playing. One of the gentlemen said that he was willing to share. And he said, the game that I play is I don't fail. And I said, that's a great game. Right? It's a great, great not to fail. And, and he said, yes, and, I, and I'm good at it. I don't fail. And I said, is there any downside to that game? And, and he kind of, we were on this big Zoom call with people all over the country. 
And he, and he looked at me kind of inquisitively and said, no, I, I don't fail. That's a great game. And I said, is there any downside to that? And he said, not that I can think of. And I said, do you ever not play a game if you're worried that you're going to fail? And it got very quiet. And he said, you could tell that he never thought of it that way. And he kind of took a breath and said, you know, there are times when I don't do everything I want to do because I'm not sure I can do it without failing. And I said, so is that a game that you want to keep playing? And he said, well, I've been playing this game a long time. I don't know who I would be without that game. And I said, well, let's just play with it. So what if there was something that was so important to you, so important to your life, that could be your health or the health of a family member or it could be anything, that was so important to you that you would risk failing to accomplish that? Something so big, so important, that you'd literally put everything on the table and roll the dice because it was that important to you. See, sometimes we play these games and, are, and the game looks like it's the most appropriate game. It looks like the game makes sense, that this is the game that we should be playing, but we don't realize that whatever game we decide, whatever rules and situations we create, there's always a, a downside. There's always a challenge. Like, like if you're playing the game that you have to look good, like all of us, our ego loves to look good. But sometimes the games in life are so important that we are willing to look bad. We are willing to, to not be seen as a great person in somebody else's eye to play the game that God's given us to play, right? That, that if you're playing the game that people have to like you, some don't. Get over it, <laughs> right? It's, is that true? Do some, does everybody love you? I'm sure they do. Like, who would, right? But sometimes they don't. And, it, and if every time you play the game, everybody has to like you, that's a weird game. Because sometimes you're not actually doing the most important thing because you're so worried about if everyone likes you. Or what if you have to play the game, I have to be right? Like, if you always have to be right, how much fun are you at parties? Right? What I've noticed about people that always have to be right is they tend to get louder when they're wrong. Right? And they get louder and louder to assert how right they are. Right? Or if you're playing the game that you have to be the smartest person in the room. Because sometimes you're not. And that has to be okay with us. Or what if you need to be needed? And what if your need to be needed is your game? And what if your need to be needed keeps you actually from doing the work that God is calling you to do because you're so focused on everybody else, you're not doing your work. See, over and over again, I want us to start from the beginning. Like, what is the game that you're playing? And just because you've been playing it for a long time, just because you're wildly successful at it, doesn't mean it's really your game. Just because you're good at it, doesn't mean you need to keep doing it. And what if you stopped? My coaching clients, one of the things I ask them is, is when you were a kid, how did you become successful? Like when you were three or four or five in your family, how did you become successful? And if people think about it long, and if they can usually say, well, I was, you know, I, I, I was kind or I was smart or I was this or I was that, and that's how I learned to be successful. And I said, can you see ways that you're still doing that in your life, that you're still playing out your same level of success. You keep doing it over and over again, even when the situation doesn't make sense. Like if, if all you've been given is a hammer, right? We've all heard that expression. Then everything is a, it's a nail. But if you have a hammer and a screwdriver and a pair of pliers, you've got more tools. I want you to clearly see how you've been successful in your life. What was the game that you played? And does it really make sense for you to keep playing that game? Or is it literally time for you to play the game that your soul really came to play? Because for many of us, we keep playing the same game because we're good at it. 
And nobody ever told us we could look at the rules or change the rules, or, or not only change the rules, but literally change the whole game and begin to play a game that's more in line with our soul, more in line with who we are, more in line with who we want to be in the world, and, and a game that would be a ton more fun than the game that we've been playing for our whole life. Like, if you have to always be good, like, <laughs> I know inherently we're all good, right? But some of us have lived a life so small because we're afraid of other people's judgment. And what if you're at a point in your life now where you get to play your game, your, live your life, and be the man or woman that you literally came to be, that God created you from the beginning? This, this is one of those tough choices where the only person that is keeping you in your game at this point is probably you. Like, but I don't know who I would be if I started to play another game. I don't know who it would be if I didn't win in the way that I know how to win. Let's find out. Let's put it to the test. See, there are three natural laws that I want to call your attention to. The first natural law is that energy is infinite, right? That there is an infinite amount of energy. And, and the, the first law of thermodynamics says energy can either be created or destroyed destroyed. It can only change forms. And then it goes on to say, and I really want you to hear the, this next line, the total amount of energy and matter in the universe remains constant, merely changing from one form to another. Now, why is that important? Well, by definition, what that means is that energy really isn't infinite. But the moment creation occurred, the infinite or the massive amount of energy that was created in that moment is so big, so huge, so unfathomable that we cannot imagine the energy that it took to create solar systems and planets and stars and black holes. It is so vast that it, to our human experience, it feels infinite. And all it's ever doing is changing form. And, and the truth is that you have all the energy you need available to you through God in your life to create whatever you choose to create, that there is nothing stopping you. There is no lack. There is no limitation that could keep you from expressing everything that you desire, that you are in the flow of this infinite energy that is spiritual, it is scientific, it is available to each and every one of us, that we have access to infinite energy. The second law is that most of what you see is not there. Right? Most of what you see is not there. Most of everything is nothing. You can, you can quote me on that, right? Like, if you see this podium, look solid, feel solid, most of this podium is nothing, right? It's atom, it's molecules, it's electrons, it's protons, it's neutrons. Most of this is nothing. Now, how do, it's space, it's emptiness, right? And now why is that an advantage to you? Well, every obstacle, every challenge, every problem that you will ever see, most of it is nothing. It looks real. It looks scary. It looks overwhelming. It looks frightening. It looks whatever it looks, but most of it is nothing. It's nothing. And that nothingness is actually keeping you from creating a greater vision of your life, to creating the next version of you, that we have this infinite power, and we're in a, in a universe that will actually be whatever we want it to be. And the third principle that I want to talk to you about as I'm as I'm kind of science geeking out, is that each person is completely creating their own reality. That each and every one of us is creating our own reality based on the first two principles. Given all the, this infinite energy and that most of everything is nothing, with those two, every one of us is creating our own reality. And, and none of those two realities look the same. 
even the reality of your loved ones and your friends and your family, not two realities are ever identical, that you've created a reality that's completely, distinctly your reality. You might have been inspired by somebody else's reality. It might mirror or celebrate somebody else's reality, but it's uniquely your reality. And your reality is created by, by what you believe, think, and expect. I'm going to go one deeper level of geeking out. When, when they began to study subatomic matter, what they found out was that subatomic matter operated from two principles. It could either be a wave or it could be a particle. And the way that it showed up was defined by the person that was observing it. So if the person observing it believed that it was going to show up as a wave, guess what it showed up as? A wave. If they believed that it was going to be a particle, guess what it showed up as? A particle. And I want you to see how incredible your universe is, that your universe will show up in exactly the way you expect it to show up. It will actually present itself in front of you based on what you believe. And that all we're ever doing in life is playing this game. And sometimes the game that we play is I'm going to play a game where I'm always the victim. It's not a lot of fun, right? But we can play that game where every situation victimizes you, where every person that comes along takes advantage of you, where every moment is harder than the moment behind it. And over and over again, it's just tough. Or you can play the game that you're always a winner, right? And then, there's, then something happens because life is constantly evolving. And even in those games, they evolve so that you have to grow and change because the universe is not static. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and better and better. One more time. Every day, in every way, my life is getting better and and better and better. Let's look at scripture. Galatians 6, 7 says, do not be deceived for God is not mocked. I love that. Boom, boom. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For by whatever a man soweth, he shall also reap. Like, that's no nonsense. Whatever you put into life, whatever thoughts and beliefs you hold on to, whatever your intention is, whatever you sow in your heart is what you will reap 100% of the time. What you put out there comes back to you over and over again. So if you don't like the game that you're playing, we have to change what we're putting out into the universe. We have to change our beliefs. We have to change our expectation because the inner part of us, the inner man, the inner person creates the outer experience. Proverbs 4.23, keep your heart with all vigilance for from it flows the spring of life. So what you believe in your heart is done unto you. And as we change that, we change our life. We change what happens to us. I want to read from Florentian. A woman came to me and asked me to speak the word. No, this is the wrong one. You'll have to read that one on your own. We have copies downstairs. Here it is. A woman came to me one hot summer day for a treatment for prosperity. She was worn out, dejected, discouraged. She said she possessed $8, and that was all she had in the world. And I said, good. God will bless that $8 and multiply them as Jesus Christ multiplied the loaves and the fishes. He taught that every man had the power to bless and multiply, to heal, to prosper. She said, what shall I do next? And I replied, follow your intuition. Have you a hunch? Do, does anything come to your mind or anything anywhere? The woman replied, I don't know. I seem to have a hunch to go home. I just have enough money for car fare. Her home was in a distant city, one that lack, with lack and limitation. And the reasoning mind, the intellect would have said, stay in New York, get work and make your money here. And I replied, then go home. Never violate a hunch. I spoke the word to her. Infinite spirit opened the way for great abundance for her. And she left 
And, and I told her to repeat it constantly. She left that for home immediately and called me a few days later and had linked up with an old friend of her family. Through this friend, she received thousands of dollars in a most mysterious and miraculous way. She said to me often, tell your people about the woman who came to you with $8 and a hunch. Right? That as we begin to open our minds, as we begin to actually see the life that we want, that we actually have the God-given right to play a different game. And whatever your family game was, whatever the story was, whatever the drama was, if you're not loving it now, change it. Change it. Change, play a happier game. Play a more loving game. Play a kinder game. Play a healthier game. You get to play whatever game you want. She also went on and said this. There's always plenty on man's pathway, but it can only be brought into manifestation through desire, faith, and the spoken word. Jesus Christ brought out clearly that man must first move. He said, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. So here's the deal. I want to talk about desire, faith, and the spoken word as the way we get to change our, our game. Now, first desire. How many of you, when you hear the word desire, make it a personal thing about you? Most of us, when we think about desire, we think about my desires. And, and there's literally nothing wrong with you having desires. I know in some spiritual communities they teach that des all desires is bad or all desires are going to lead you astray or walk you down the wrong path. But I want you to hear me say today that, that you get to have your desires. But the desire that I'm most interested in is what's God's desire for you. I want you to actually be in that question. Holy Spirit, what is your desire for me? Because what I find is that when I'm just operating from what I want, it's a pretty limited conversation. When I open it up and say, okay, God, what do you want for me? It literally changes the game because it moves me from an ego-centered reality to a God-centered reality. And for most of us, we've never taken the time to say, God, what is your greatest desire for me? What is the greatest level of good that you can imagine for me? And actually spend time in prayer and meditation, opening up to the desires of God to really hear him, and actually shifting from an egocentric life to a God-centric life. And, and that's a huge step. God, what is your greatest desire for me? And then when spirit begins to reveal it, I promise you that it's going to feel like too much. It's going to feel like, oh, I can't have that much, or that's too good. That's got to be ego. And it's actually not. It's spirit tapping at the door of your heart, trying to offer you a life that's infinitely greater than you've ever imagined before. So the first thing I want you to play with is what is God's truest, highest, greatest desire for you, and are you willing to entertain it? Are you willing to allow your mind and heart and soul to be open to that possibility that you actually can actually feel God's desire for you? And that takes us to faith. If God gives you a desire, it would be a cruel God to give you a desire without the means to make it possible. Would that be cruel? If I said, would you like to go to Disneyland? And then I said, ha ha, you don't get to go. How much fun would that be? Right? That would not be fun, right? That if God's going to give you a desire, if God's going to place a desire in your heart, God will also guarantee the way to make that desire a reality. That you're actually no longer working out of what you can do, and it now becomes a, a game with what God can do. When you entertain the desires of God, and then you actually have the faith, if God's given me this desire, it is God's will for me. And if it's God's will for me, doors will open, things will happen, people will come into my life, and I actually have the faith to allow that desire to become a reality. And third, you gotta speak the word. You gotta speak the word. That, that over and over again, you gotta speak the word. And as we speak the word, we watch things happen. We watch, 
which watch changes every day in every way. My life gets better and better and better. And if you don't like that one, how about this one? I am divinely blessed. Or God's good easily fills my life. That I want you to begin to speak the word of God in faith and know that as you speak it in faith, it will be done unto you. So here's your homework. You ready? First thing I want you to look at is I want you to be looking at the game that you're playing with life. And I want to make sure that the game that you're playing is still your game. Maybe it was never your game, but I want you to really look at the game you're playing and see if it's time for you to create a bigger game. Two, I want you to open a space for the des to allow the desires of God to be placed on your heart so that you feel like you truly know what's God's desire for you, for your loved ones, for your family. And three, I want you to speak the word in faith. I want you to speak the word in faith every day, knowing that as you speak the word, those words do not come back to you void, but they come back to you carrying the very goodness of God. That, that as we use our words to proclaim the truth, Jesus said, let your answer be yes, yes, or no, no, for anything else makes God crazy. That's a bit of a paraphrase. <laughs> he said it comes of evil, right? And so today, what I want you to see is that we have this ability to radically change the game that we are playing. And some of us are carrying this deep place of feeling like a victim, that we've been given this game or we've been given this thing that we have to do that was never ours to do. And we keep carrying this heavy burden and feeling overwhelmed and depressed and upset. And it's not your game. It was never your game. It was never your process. It was never what God wanted for you. And today, I want us to be mature enough to pick a new game, to listen to God in a way maybe you never have before and say, God, what is your will for me? What is the greatest level of good that I can know in my life? I want that. I want to move toward that. Are you willing? Will you pray with me? And I invite you to open your mind, your heart, your soul to the activity of God. That there is but one presence and one power, God the good. And today, everything's on the table. We hold nothing back from God. Whatever the story, whatever the drama, whatever the situation, we place it on the table. And we simply say, thy will be done. God, what is your greatest desire for me? What is the life that you offer me? And what if I said yes? What if you revealed a level of life, a level of good that was greater than I've ever known before? Today I say yes, I say yes, I say yes. And in the name and in the power of the living Christ, in the awareness of Jesus Christ who stands right next to you today, we say thank you, God. And so it is.